of financial argument or its staff. Opinions expressed in this video do not constitute personalized investment advice and should not be relied on for making investment decisions. With us this week, a new guest. He is Daniel Oliver Jr., managing m member of Miracon Capital. Hey, Daniel, thanks for coming to our podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. So, Daniel, over the years, I've heard you on other podcasts, um, you know, regarding precious metals and, and precious metal mining, investing, etc. I value your opinions and market analysis. But this latest piece you published titled Our Currency and Our Problem, which I will backlink in our show notes. Uh, I was hoping you might take us and, and the listeners through the larger points you made in this publication. You know what the ramifications may mean, not just long term, but even in the coming months, quarters. I suppose just to start, what, what is the general thesis of this recent piece you published? Yeah, sure. So, so the term, but even in the coming months, quarters, I, I suppose just to start, what, what is the general thesis of this recent piece you published? Yeah, sure. So, so the the, the title, our currency, our problem, uh, is a takeoff from a quote by Nixon's Treasury Secretary when he told the Europeans that the dollar was our currency, but your problem, and and and, and that came from um, the the sense that. That Americans have, and rightly so, that we've been the hyperpower, as the French call us, for the last century, uh, economically, politically, and militarily. And, and certainly that was the case, especially at the end of World War II, uh, when, when really the U.S. is the only game in town. And it was in that context that the current global financial system was constructed. Everyone met at Bretton Woods. The only two people who mattered really were were, uh, were the U.S. delegate, uh, Harry White and, and Keynes, uh, the, the you know, British uh, representative the British the, the British were weak at that point but they still had a lot of more uh, moral suasion mm -hmm. but anyway the, the the structures as I'm sure you know most of your listeners know uh, uh, set up the dollar US dollars and the US uh, uh, Treasury Fed Reserve would hold the gold and as it was set up those countries those central banks could redeem their dollars for gold anytime they wanted to and this was at a time when the US had I think about two-thirds the known gold in the world and the dollar was backed 84 percent by gold so so it was really a a, a a financial superpower we had because we had all the all the credit we were the world's largest creditor nation again we had the world's really only powerful military at that point and, and our economy was enormous so so from that point to really today uh, the whole world and especially Americans uh, have been riding on that, riding on that, on those three pillars of American power, really without questioning it. And and the point of the, of the article was to show that all three of those pillars that support the dollar have have really weakened dramatically. And and first, if we look at uh, military, uh, uh, you know, the, the adventures in in the Middle East uh, by the, by the Bush administrations, by the Bush administrations, uh, it weakened. I think Americans resolved to go to war. I mean, they, these were mostly pointless, poisonous adventures. Didn't result in a whole lot, and were tremendously expensive, and and had all sorts of uh, uh, damage sociologically. So I think that we're not quite as as keen to go to war as, as we used to be, which I think is a good thing, but it, it's a bad thing the way it happened. Mm -hmm. And then you have Obama, who really gutted the military. I mean, he cut all the budgets. He he was focusing on making it uh, a social experiment instead of uh, fighting wars. I, you know, one of the things about military technology is it takes about 10 years to deploy new technology. So if you stop if you stop investing, you still have that momentum from the previous investments, but then you don't have anything more. And what's happened is, as uh, is all of the news, is the Russians and the Chinese are busy developing these hypersonic weapons to which the U.S. has no defense. So mm -hmm. the aircraft carriers become sitting ducks. And what that does is it really prevents the U.S. from projecting its power militarily. So, so that pillar has has, has very much weakened. Uh, on, the, uh, on the financial side, the U.S. has gone from being the largest creditor nation uh, to the largest debtor nation. And, uh, and gold barely backs the Federal Reserve now. It's about seven percent of the dollar is backed by gold, so yeah, it, it's not really a, a, a major factor. And economically, uh, again, you know, the, the policies that especially the Obama administration put into place, and but also Republicans are, are quasi socialists in the way they, they run things, uh, has has really hurt the U.S. economy, especially relative to other countries, Russia and especially China and, and, and other places. So the U.S. is no longer dominant economically. So the point of the article in, 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 the, in brief was, was that those three things to support the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency are not there. All, all that really maintains it is momentum. And I didn't put in the piece, but I think it's a 
interesting thing to think about. Um, the, the UK was really the, the world's major power long after the reasons for it to be so had ended. Uh, and and as, as you may recall, and as you may recall, uh, in, in, in 1967, um, the, the, the Brits and the French tried to wrest the Suez Canal back from Egypt, which had nationalized it. And, and the, and they landed their troops in, in Egypt and under some pretext. And Eisenhower said, drop dead. He said, you, you got to withdraw or I'm not lending you the billion dollars you need to stabilize your currency. And the pound collapsed. And they and they left dramatically all of a sudden from Suez. And that was really the end of the British Empire. I mean, it ended long ago and in, 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 uh, you know, realistically, but politically that was, that was the end. Mm-hmm. And, and it, 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 you know, what, what, what concerns me is the U S is so aggressive militarily and financially and economically with, you know, fact and all these things, we lord mm-hmm. it over everyone else. And, and, and what's the real power behind that? And, and at the moment it's, I think it's becoming more and more momentum and that's dangerous because what happens is at some point there's some event that occurs. I don't know if it'll be in the Ukraine or in Taiwan or someplace like that. And the U S uh, uh, may find a situation where all of a sudden uh, we just simply don't have the power to project the, this this uh, this hyper you know uh, uh, power we've had for the last uh, uh, hundred years and, and all of a sudden the thing collapsed dramatically. So that that's that's my concern. That was really the point of the of the paper. Right. Uh, you just mentioned briefly about how we're putting all these sanctions. We're using FATCA and, and OFAC, et cetera, et cetera, to put pressure on regimes that perhaps we want change in. Right. So. You know, for instance, in of recent, you have this Venezuela situation, um, which is, uh, it just shows, um, I kind of how, you know, we've obviously sanctioned them for, you know, decade plus. Um, and Lord knows what the in repercussions are going to be. It's, it's like the unknown unknowns that can come yeah, out of this and, kind of stuff. And, and, and I think it's important to, to distinguish two different things. And that is, um, there are very, there are lots of very bad people out there and, right. and, and bad places, nasty countries that do bad things. And before, you could say World War One, but really before World War Two, the, the U.S. didn't think of itself as an imperial power. So, you know, we didn't imp- approve of what maybe some African dictator did or, or, or Maduro, these people, but it wasn't our job to fix it. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, George Washington's farewell address was, look, you know, we have a huge country here on our continent. We've got two oceans that separate us from Europe and Asia. Let's just focus on our own affairs and, and we can trade with them but let's not get politically involved that's what that was his parting advice we basically followed that advice for almost 150 years mm-hmm. and then we got directly involved so, so to say we shouldn't be involved in those places isn't to condone what they're doing it's just saying you know the, the u.s should be thinking of itself as more of a republic and less of an empire but the, the, the example i supplied in the in that letter was, was turkey because what's interesting about turkey is uh, uh last summer uh, Turkey looked like it was about to collapse, right? Well, they, they did the classic thing that a lot of emerging mar- countries do, which is they, they borrow dollar debts externally because the interest rate is lower if you borrow debts in dollars. And they use what a lot of emerging mar- countries do, which is they, they borrow dollar debts externally because the interest rate is lower if you borrow debts in dollars. And they used it to construct various malinvestments, you know, lots of shopping malls and office towers, things that aren't particularly productive. They're more consumption items. Mm-hmm. And, and that's great while the momentum's lasting. And then when interest rates go up, especially uh, in dollar terms, all of a sudden they, they discover they can't pay their debts back. And then the, the, the normal situation is they default. The IMF shows up, which is, again, part of the Bretton Woods system. Western banks supply the new capital. They take the collateral. Mm-hmm. Uh, of, all, of all the choice assets and 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 they get to you know economically colonize countries that way right and and there are two things about that story that are very interesting one is uh turkey's disappeared from the news it's like well you know what, what happened how come it didn't default why didn't the imf show up and, and part of the answer is they made deals with iran for oil which is one of the main export imports uh russia and china it turns out china's got tons of dollars that they don't really want 60 years which is they show up in places like africa or malaysia or thailand and they say hey we'll we'll lend you 100 million dollars uh or billion dollars whatever it is against some project which they know is going to fail and they don't care about that because what they do is they they assign collateral to things they really want we get your port right right, right. so like in africa that they lent it some railroad company that had no chance of paying it back, but but the 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 the, uh, the, the Kenyans in the loan agreement surrendered their sovereign their sovereignty, mm-hmm. uh, sovereign immunity, and, and the collateral was was the port of Mombasa. I mean, what, you know, what a great prize! So the, the Chinese are le- these you know hedge funds call it loan to own, right? They loan money they don't really want back. What they want is is to foreclose in the collateral, which are strategic assets, mm-hmm. and so the, the Chinese are basically 
piggybacking now on the dollar system because they have so many dollars. And, and, and it has a few implications. One is that China is now this competing rival empire. The fact that Turkey has so far anyway gotten off the dollar hook shows that there's a now shows that there's a now functioning Eastern uh, a financial block that is competing with, with, with the Western financial block. So again, it's not just military competition. It's, it's, it's geopolitical. It's, it's economic and it's financial competition. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and again, all, all these things, you know, one of the reasons why if you're have a lot of dollar loans, you, you don't just default and walk away is because the whole world is in the dollar system. If you do that, you never get financing again. Well, all, all of a sudden, if there's an alternate place to go, but maybe it's not so painful just simply to default and walk away. And what are the implications then for Western banks that have been playing this game for decades? Right. Uh, and, and and so it, it, it really changes the dynamic of the whole global system. And, and what it boils down to, again, is we're, we're moving from what was a bipolar world between the, the Soviets and the U.S., although the U.S. had all the economic might because everyone in the U.S. orbit Europe and so on and so forth, free economies were much, much richer and more powerful to a unipolar world where the U.S. was the only game in town. And that was feared away, feared away by Clinton and, and, and the Bushes and the Obamas. And, and now we're entering into a multipolar world. And, mm-hmm. and, and, that, and that, again, it's hard to imagine the dollar retaining its unipolar status in a multipolar world. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there, though. I mean, if you think about uh, just in general commentary in the financial world, um, you know, who just still have the unipolar glasses on. They think just because China or Russia have bad actors, this means that it just it can't stand up against us. You know, somehow we're we're morally better. You know, and to me, that just sounds delusional and childlike. But um, that's a lot of times what I run into when I'm talking to different people. You know, they think the dollar you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's basically its dominance is, uh, is unchallenged. Even with all these things that you're pointing out, it's just this idea that somehow technology or things can't change quickly. Um, it just doesn't seem to dawn on them. I, I don't well, get it. Well, that's the point of Suez, right? Or, mm-hmm. or, 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 um, you know, in, in the great depression, Britain, again, sterling pound standard, all the central banks kept pounds as their reserve currency. One day Britain just devalued it all. And, mm-hmm. and so these central banks were bereft of capital. And, one of the points I make in the in the paper is that uh, the, the U.S. had a strong dollar policy. It, it did. I mean, it sounds like a joke now, but it really did have a strong dollar policy for, for the decades following Bretton Woods. Mm-hmm. And, and the way they maintained it was, as I mentioned earlier, uh, European central banks had the right to redeem their dollars for gold. And the more the U.S. printed, Kennedy and Johnson printed to, to fund their war in Vietnam and, and their social programs, the more Europeans showed up and said, hey, here are dollars, give us our gold. So the U.S. gold position declined by two thirds mm-hmm. and then Nixon who it was no saint but it really wasn't his fault in the sense that uh, he was faced with actually uh, I, I, I had been told that there was a French destroyer sailing across the Atlantic to pick up the rest of the French gold mm-hmm. so he was faced with this crisis mm-hmm. of, do we give them all the rest of our gold or not and the answer mm-hmm. is no, we're not going to and, and the dollar do we give them all the rest of our gold or not and the answer mm-hmm. is no, we're not going to and, and the dollar the dollar you know uh, swiftly collapsed and it was reestablished you know, but it had been established on the gold system. We had all the gold, so the dollar was valuable. And it was reestablished on the debt system. Like all the other, all the other countries have U.S. dollar debt. They owe dollars. You know, they're debt in dollar terms. They need dollars to pay interest payments. So they don't pay. They default, and we get their assets. Mm-hmm. And that is what has supported the dollar for so long in the absence of any any financial uh, uh, wealth. So so th- that's why these these developments. Mm-hmm. So undermine the status of dollar because if you don't need to pay your dollar debts back as, as a foreign country, it, it really it, it 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 weakens the international position of the dollar. And, and then, if, if there's no international demand for dollars to to, to pay these debts back, th- then the market says, okay, well, you know, what is the point of dollar? Why, why is a dollar valuable? And and then I think what 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 happens in non empires and, and you know, when you don't have the international reserve currency is you see what what what's backing it? What what the dollar is today? The definition of a dollar today is a unit of liability of the Fed Reserve. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. And so you say, well, what 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 uh, what assets does the Fed have? And it used to have gold, and that's what it had. Or, and then it had gold, and it had uh, 90-day commercial uh, bills, asset-backed, not, not not general liabilities, but asset-backed commercial bills. Mm-hmm. And now they have 30-year government bonds. They have funky real estate uh, 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 mortgages uh, in, in in these weird uh, structures. And so the answer is they're, they're – their assets are, are not just impaired, they're highly, highly interest rate sensitive. So when you dial up interest rates, which they've been doing, they really crush the value of the uh, the Federal Reserve's assets. In fact, I, I think 
they're already technically insolvent because the, because they've because the longer term your bond is, the more sensitive it is to rates. So the rent, more rates go up, mm-hmm. the more you lose in under present value. So so the dollar's backing is really really weak on a financial basis. On the value of the dollar, that's very unusual. It usually happens is you know, if you look over hundreds of currency crises over hundreds or even thousands of years, is it goes longer and then it just crashes one day or yeah. in a week, yeah. three days, a weekend. So that, that that's where we're headed is, is a is a sudden uh, uh, recognition by the market that that the that the dollar really doesn't have a lot of value. Now, if you look at it out of the currency landscape um, at the moment, you know the, the next largest currency that competes with the U.S. dollar is the euro. My hunch is uh, we will see some issues there at some point, where Germany or someone else in powerful in Europe wants to start dictating some terms and growing its size and scope. Perhaps is that something that you might you think is possible that the euro may may end up becoming more competitive with the dollar at times, or is there is their banking system so screwed up that it makes ours look okay? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the, the euro has been managed better in the sense that um, traditional economists just think just care about money supply. That's all I care about. So right. the um, traditional economists just think just care about money supply. That's all I care about. So right. the dollar, if if the if Bernanke had a trillion dollar QE and the, and the you know euros are a trillion dollar QE, it's the same thing. It's a trillion dollars, trillion euros. But it's actually very different. You know, the initial QEs on the European side again were were short term asset backed paper, not thirty year government bonds. There's an enormous difference if you if you monetize one versus the other. I, I, Europe has tremendous problems. I mean, mm-hmm. Italy has is a mess. Mm-hmm. Uh, Italy has lots of loans to places like Turkey, mm-hmm. which again, I mean, you got to wonder whether they get the dollars back and and whose whose problem is it? is it a Turkish problem or an Italian problem? And the French have lots of loans to, to the Italians. Mm-hmm. Um, and meanwhile, Germany. What, what, what the German, German economy is, is making things like Mercedes, these big long-term capital items. Right. And when you dial up interest rates, the demand for that stuff goes way, way down. Everyone finances their car. No one pays for the car in cash, or very few people do. So, uh, so the point is, when, in, in a higher interest rate environment, I don't, when, in, in a higher interest rate environment, I don't know how well Germany does. So I, I think it's a mess. That, that, that conversation, euro versus dollar, currency strategists care a lot about it. And right. what's relatively better and i don't really have a strong opinion about that because i don't really care because both can go down in terms of gold i mean mm-hmm. I, they're, they're both going to and and the, you, what you're really asking is which will go down against gold faster the <laughs> or, I, I you know I, I don't i don't have a strong opinion about that yeah uh, but what i'm pretty sure about it is that they're both going down yeah right i mean if you just take it back to 2000 to today um you know it's it's obvious that every currency has been going down versus bullion so uh that that general trend appears to still be intact into the 2020s. And so I, I, I suppose I agree with you. I, I could care less because I don't have much allocation to either. Um, there are folks out there, obviously, who are hoarding cash, hoping to get, you know, be able to buy assets on the cheap if we do have a financial downturn in the coming years. But, um, you know, that remains to be seen. I want to bring but, it back. By the way, I, I just don't our system. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, were about, there, were, well, there were about $4 trillion in the monetary base. Uh, and about ninety nine zero trillion dollars of dollar denominated debt, if you add it all up, and that debt requires interest payments all day long. And, mm-hmm. and so, how do you pay back ninety trillion when you have four trillion dollars of money? And because the Fed tightening, uh, that that's gone down to about three and a half trillion. So they've actually taken a half a trillion base dollars off the table, mm-hmm. which makes the potential for a short squeeze very very high. That's what happened in two thousand eight, and that's what usually does happen in financial crises. Is there's a huge Demand all at once as everyone starts uh, liquidating, everyone starts uh, you know getting margin calls and, and cross defaults and all those things. They need dollars now, and so they dump everything: gold, stocks, bonds, whatever they they can to pay their debts back because they don't they lose their collateral, and that's really bad. So that's mm-hmm. why gold got hit in 2008. I don't know that happens again uh, in in terms of gold because I don't know how owned gold is in the West. I mean, you, you have to be able to dump it, uh, and if you have to have it to be able to sell it, you have to be able to dump it. Uh, and it, 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 you have to have it to be able to sell it, and the managed money is probably short gold, not long. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know that it happens again in gold. I'm pretty sure it happens for everything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, but I think it might. I, it's certainly possible. I mean, I, I don't know what, what what that's a short-term question. I'm, I'm a bit agnostic on, but I'm pretty convinced that even if it does happen, uh, the, we know how the Fed's going to respond. I mean, they have their toolkit, they call it, right? Mm-hmm. They have these tools, the tools, and the tools. With different tools, it's all one of the same tool: print money. That's the only tool they really have, right? right. Print more money, and to to, and they do it to bail out the debtors. 
And when they do that, goal's going to go berserk. And mm-hmm. so, again, whether gold goes on first or not, I, I don't know. But, but I'm pretty sure that either way, it goes crazy when, when the Fed is forced into a position where they have to respond. Mm-hmm. And then just looking out, you can see some of the government's um, projections as far as, you know, what, what, the, what the budgets are doing, how much tax revenue is coming in. It appears that, uh, these, you know, obviously with this about face recently with Powell, you know, having dinner with Trump and, and, uh, and whatever, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, um, you know, being a little bit more dovish in his speak over the last month ever since the, the, the uh, Christmas Eve uh, crash. Um, he, yeah. Uh, you know, th- this gives me the impression, and I just saw recently, you know, the, the San Francisco Federal Reserve's talking about, you know, we would have done better if we did negative interest rates after the 2008 financial crisis. So, you know, it would have been great. So it's like, you know, just obvious trial balloons is what perhaps may be the longer term uh, trajectory, maybe where we go. Um, do you, I mean, just looking out, I mean, it feels like we may end up going Japanese. We may end up having the Federal Reserve buying even more assets, uh, even equities, perhaps, who knows, uh, or and, and doing QE and maybe moving interest rates even to negative territories. Do you ever think of those terms? I mean, is that even a possibility? Do you- oh, I, absolutely it is. I mean, I, again, the, the, the whole... I don't want to get too involved in this possibility. Do you- oh, I, absolutely it is. I mean, I, again, the, the the whole. I don't want to get too involved in this conversation, but but basically, if you, if you look back at, at constitutional law, I used to be constitutional you know, lawyer. I used to be a lawyer and study constitutional law at law school. Um, there, there's no power in the Constitution for the, for the feds to charter and regulate banks. So where does the power come from? It comes from the incidental power. Uh, to raise taxes. In other words, the whole argument, if you look at the old cases for the first bank in the United States, the second bank in the United States, the bank system, uh, was all about, well, the banks help us raise taxes. That is their legal foundation. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so and so the feds never let the banks go down because because they, they fund the state by uh, by buying treasury bonds. That's what they that's their function. And so mm-hmm. and so there's no chance that, that the Fed will will ever let that happen. And so when the next crisis comes, and it will be worse than the last crisis, we know this because the last crisis was a debt crisis, and there's a lot more debt now than there right. was last time. So therefore, that's better. I mean, it's a bit of BS because yeah. what the bank's been doing is that they've been lending the money to people who do these crazy things, mm-hmm. and so on their balance sheets, hey, we don't have any of this subprime garbage. But in turn, what they have is loans to other institutions doing subprime garbage. So it's the same. The it's, same it's just a, accounting trickery, essentially, mark yeah. to model basis, a whole bunch of gimmicks to, yeah, to make things look better than they are. Yeah, and it's worse than that. I mean, in the in the uh, I, I had a letter last summer um, where I where I explained this in in, in gruesome detail. And on the, on the on the mortgage market, for example, what they do is um, that they lend the money to shady people who who lend mortgages to these borrowers, and then the the shady lenders. Flip it to Fannie Mae, and yeah. Fannie Mae yeah. securitizes it, and guarantees it, and the banks buy it back. And these banks say, "Hey, look, our balance sheets are great because we've got no exposure because it's all guaranteed by Fannie Mae." And that's true, right? In a way, now Fannie Mae, as you probably know, only has an implicit guarantee from the government. It says the bonds right in the front. There are no guarantees here. Everyone knows it collapses. But then you're faced with this question: Okay, does the Congress not bail out Fannie Mae, let the whole housing market collapse? That's door number one or door number, number two. Do they print up a trillion, two trillion, six trillion dollars and, and bail them out? I mean, that's door number two. And so, again, uh, you know, either way, gold is well, either in, in, a, in a relative sense or in, in a price mm-hmm. sense, but it's, it's coming other way. So, so the, the point is that these, these banks are just as pernicious, if not worse, than they were before 2008 crisis. And mm-hmm. so, the next crisis will be worse, and, and the Fed will have to print more money and debate the dollar that much faster. Right. So, bringing it maybe toward the short term uh, on gold and silver, what are you what are you seeing in in, the, in those markets today? What are you thinking about um, gold and silver action for the year? You know, I think it looks pretty positive. I mean, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a little agnostic when the music stops, which way gold goes, because I can see both sides. I right. can see a short squeeze setting it down. On the other hand, I can see the Fed uh, uh, reacting very fast. But my understanding is both sides. I right. can see a short squeeze setting it down. On the other hand, I can see the Fed. Uh, uh, reacting very fast but my understanding is that um from what i read uh that the fed was really blindsided about 2008 they, they were reading about what was happening in the wall street journal the next day right? <laughs> and and so they don't like that obviously so they 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 have moles in the big banks i mean i mean they, they have their own people working in the banks so that they can get the information before the market does and react to it mm-hmm. and, and i think the implication of that is that they're not going to let the whole system blow up where the market, where the banks collapse, 
uh, they'll they'll print the money before everyone else knows about it. Essentially, so I mm-hmm. think the I think the scope for gold to go down is is probably pretty small because of that. Because you don't have the momentum chasers, you don't have uh, you've got short positions in, in, in that we get cleaned out. You've got the Fed uh, able to react much faster than it did last time, and 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 they've you know used these quote unquote tools before, mm-hmm. so they can react that much faster. So I I think. I think short term and, and long term we're heading much much higher. But again, I mean, on the short term, I'm I'm yeah. much less clear about that because I just don't know. That, that really depends on on when and how the policymakers decide to react. And that's I mean, I can guess about that, but that's sure. that really depends on what what they do. Sure. So I've done some studies about uh, you know we, what we discussed earlier about uh, how much gold filtered out of the United States after World War II. Uh, John Exeter, uh, I believe, was the head of the New York Federal uh, Reserves. Um, it's the department that basically oversaw the gold, the gold that was going out the window, essentially. Uh, yeah. And so you had a drawdown of, you know, I think it was over 20,000 tons we had at the time, uh, down to whatever we claim now, 8,000 tons. And he oversaw a good portion of that gold going out the door. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously he turned mega gold bull at the time and, uh, always advanced warned for decade after decade about the, implication. if you looked at us earlier, you, you're talking about the assets on the federal reserves balance sheet, uh, how, how, how long dated they are and how questionable they are. Um, you know, if you look out in the future at a point where say there is a dollar crisis, what are the things that the federal reserve may have to do in order to recuperate confidence? Yeah, you know, so so John actually was a fascinating figure because he he lived in a time when there were still people like him at big banks like Chase, which I think it was before, and the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. The people actually, I mean, it wasn't a dominant voice, but it was a minority voice. Now there's nobody. I mean, if you if you if John actually showed up today, he he would be laughed out the door. I mean, yeah, they would, right. you know, it wouldn't. Listen. So so the whole world's changed, and and not for the better. And I so my my own calculations are and, and they may seem a little crazy but it's kind of just looking at history and math and, and that is if you look at the central banks of the of the fed back to 1914 and the and the bank of england back to 1704 um the gold has backed the liabilities of the dominant central bank by a third on average now <laughs> this was not an artifact of the gold standard this was an artifact of the fact that for most of that time you could show up at the bank of england or the fed with gold and say I want dollars, or you can show up with dollars and say I want my gold. So in other words, the, the gold came in and out of the bank under, under market principles, and it was the market that set this set this ratio, not the central bankers themselves. Mm-hmm. And that number, interestingly, the Federal Reserve since 1971, since Nixon took us off the gold standard, is 28 percent. So mm-hmm. it's actually not that much different in in, in the cold post gold standard era. Now, since 71, that ratio has become Nixon took us off the gold standard is 28 percent. So it's actually not that much different in, in, in the cold, post-gold standard era. Now, since 71, that ratio has become much more volatile. Um, and, and where it stands today is around, I think, 7.5%, so a number like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that, that is and the rest of the balance sheet of these funky uh, mortgages and, and long-term government bonds. So I'm, I, I think the, the market is going to force that ratio back to a third, at mm-hmm. least. That, that, that's the equilibrium level. And that is at a time when the balance of the assets were short-term commercial bills, mm-hmm. not 30-year going bonds. So in fact, that ratio, I think, looked a lot higher. Yeah. And, and and that's how you get to gold prices above 10000 And right. that sounds a little crazy today. But again, it's just it's just looking at the Fed's balance sheet and saying, how big is it? And, and what does 10000 mean? It means about two-thirds backing by gold. And in 1980, that number got over 100%. Right for for like a long that, time, not just for a minute either. That was like well, it lasted thousand dollars an ounce. Okay, right. so that's not like the equilibrium level. That that's how that's sort of the the max craziness it got to, and mm-hmm. then it corrected back uh, to, uh, to to lower levels, mm-hmm. which I think would be more of today's terms, more like eight nine thousand dollars an ounce. So that, mm-hmm. that's sort of what the equilibrium would be. But that assumes that the Fed's balance sheet doesn't change in size, and that's not a good assumption, as you pointed out. When the crisis comes. And they need to print dollars fast, and they print them again. Not not because they're uh, uh, insane; they're doing it because all their friends, the big banks and the big PE firms, are blowing up. They need the money. You know, Goldman Sachs needs the money. Chase is going to need the money. AIG needed the money, mm-hmm. and so they they, print, they just can't imagine the world without these institutions. Right. And so they print the money on that basis, and so it's hard to imagine the Fed's balance sheet not doubling or tripling again. Mm-hmm. And all those numbers I just mentioned. Then double and triple in size, and so uh, it, you know, it, it, it's it's the, the number of gold is going to go to when the Fed 
when this whole system unwinds are, are, is going to stun apps we weren't are, is going to stun people and you know this isn't Weimar Germany stuff, right? I mean, gold went from thirty five dollars an ounce in nineteen seventy one to eight seventy five uh in, in nineteen eighty. Right. So in nine years. And the world didn't collapse. We weren't didn't have wheelbarrows and people were on the street, you know, exactly. begging for food. I mean it it just it just people adapt and and and, and they will adapt again. And so I don't I, I don't I don't think we're heading towards Zimbabwe yet. Right. But um but but the point is you you can imagine easily a ninety percent decline in the value of the dollar and, mm-hmm. and just that's just just, that's just the 1970s. Yeah, um, I mean, if you just so, look at 1933 and 1934 in general, that's a 70% devaluation versus gold, and that was too low a price, and it was too deflationary a price of $35 going from 20, 20 bucks, right? So it's it, it, this has right. happened, and this, by the way, I, I've even gone deeper. Like you go back to like the greenback era, and and the and the the craziness that happened with the gold price back then, you know, going from 20 bucks to 160 dollars. That's in our history. Happened. Yeah, that's. Point. And people adapt. So, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it sounds crazy to say gold is going to 10, 15,000. I know, I know. But, but, but the point is that history tells you it happens. And, and that, you know, again, like a lot of people rich today won't be then, and then people who, who, who are clever and, and make some money along the way. But it, it, well, the world won't end. The country won't end. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just one of those things you live through. So that, that, that's coming. And, and, and the, what it really is, 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 Again, if you go back to pre-1933, the, the way the market would stage a run on such a banks is, again, you could show up at at the bank and say, here, my dollars, my gold, or my marks, or my pounds, or wherever they are. And so the, the, the central bank would have to disgorge gold, and they'd run out of gold, and then they'd divide the currency. Today, you can't do that. You can't go to the Federal Reserve and say, here's $100 million, give me gold. But you can go to the coin store. Right, mm-hmm. it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to redeem. I don't want these dollars anymore. I want, I want to get gold. And I got to get out of the. I want to get out of the system, and that's how you do it. Mm-hmm. And so the way the market stages are run on the Fed today is by raising the gold price. That's how it does by raising the gold price. That's how it does it. Mm-hmm. And we haven't seen that yet because the 2008 was a commercial bank crisis, and because of what the central banks have done in their balance sheets, the next crisis is going to be a currency crisis, a central bank credit crisis, and again. The, the way gold's function is to balance balance sheets, and gold has to go to a price that's going to balance uh, the Fed and the and the ECB and the BOJ and the and the uh, Bank of England. All all those balance sheets will get balanced, and the way they do it is the gold price goes to price that balances them, and that right. price again today is is up around six eight thousand under normal circumstances, and in a crisis it can go beyond that, and if they raise their their asset level, it can go beyond that even. So right, right. so it's it's you know when it happens, it'll happen fast, and it'll be. Uh, quite dramatic. I should point out that that 10-year devaluation in the 70s, you know, it really happened. There were really two parts to that, right? It, it, it was what 71 to 73, and then I don't know, 78 to 80. It, it, it wasn't yeah. a whole decade. There, there were two, uh, 71 to 73, and then I don't know, 78 to 80. It, it, it wasn't yeah. a whole decade. There, there were two. Well, similar uh, to that to this that we were seeing, 2000 to 2000, you know, 11 roughly, with a little bump in the road. Uh, right. And now we've been consolidating. And I, I would argue derivatives have obviously played a part in stretching this out. I mean, this is a, this is a more complex, um, gold pool that's being run. Uh, but w- what we have right. here is, uh, you know, a game of, uh, you know, a lot of fractional reserve fake gold versus the actual thing, the real stuff. And where's the real stuff been going? East, uh, obviously, right. you know, that's so right. here we are with a more complex show. Uh, but uh, it is happening similarly, I suppose. You could say there's some rhyming going on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book on the history of credit bubbles when I have time. It's almost done. And, and you can trace this stuff back 5,000 years to Mesopotamia. There were 28-day collapses in Mesopotamia. <laughs> uh, and and there, you know, there's well-recorded – the first well-recorded interest uh, it drives the panic in Rome in A.D. 33. I mean, again, this is <laughs> nothing new about this. It's It's <laughs> – it's all historical, and it happens exactly the same way each time. And and so the part of the book I'm working on is, is if you understand history, you understand what drives these things, you can then understand the context in which you're in, and, yeah. and then have a pretty good sense of of what's coming next. And again, I don't have precise timing what's coming next, but we are, I think, past the apex of this particular credit cycle mm-hmm. uh, with the Fed raising rates and, and you see stress in the market, you see stress in the level loan market, all, all the peripheral markets having stress. That's how these, these things always start, whether it's sort of a countries or, or, or subprime or, or levered loan or whatever it might be. And, uh, you know, d- don't forget the, the, the uh, real estate market in the U.S. started melting down 
in mid-07, and Lehman doesn't come till the autumn of 08. Right. So I think that's sort of where we are. We're sort of in the, there, there's a bit of smoke coming out. There's no big deal yet. We're sort of, in, there, there's a, right. so I think that's sort of where we are. We're sort of in the, there, there's a bit of smoke coming out. There's no big deal yet. We're sort of in the summer of 07, maybe the spring of 07. Yeah. So I don't think we're well, imminently at Lehman, but we're, we're approaching it. And it might happen faster because everyone is more attuned to these problems. Uh, and, and so it might accelerate. Yeah. Uh, we think. But I think I, that's where we are. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a little bit about your take on silver. I, I presume in this context that silver is just going to do the, the standard thing where it kind of, you know, it follows gold, but like not, 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 not super sharp. And then uh, it goes aggressively and exponential at some point, kind of the spike and dive metal that it typically is. Yeah, so I, I, my view on silver is a little more complex than that. It's, if you look back at monetary history, silver was always a transactional metal, mm-hmm. right? You, you went to the market with your silver. You didn't go to the market with gold because you know, who wants to make change for gold coins? Mm-hmm. You, you don't buy a banana with a gold coin. I mean, you're, you, you buy a house with gold. You buy a business right. with gold, yeah. Right, so you buy your ship, your, your management came back. So gold is the, is the money of capital, and silver is the money of, is, of goods, essentially. And so, and so if you look at the Great Depression, when the banks blew up, capital had big problems. So gold did very well. I mean, it was illegal in the U.S., but but they raised the price. And uh, actually, U.S. You could, you could own it. Silver did terribly, and the reason is because the dollar, as a transactional medium, never had any problems. It, it got truth wrong if anything happened. Uh, whereas in the '70s, you had a capital problem. The banks didn't fail, but but if you, if your money was in deposit in a bank, it wasn't doing very well because of inflation, mm-hmm. and the dollar was not a good. A medium to go shopping and 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 keep short, little bit of money in. So the dollar, silver went crazy compared to gold. Mm-hmm. And so it's a it's a, a different bet. It's a bet on whether the credit collapse will be inflationary or deflationary. Right. And I think it's important to understand that. I, now I think I'm, I'm almost positive that this credit collapse will be inflationary, and so silver will outperform gold because of that reason. Mm-hmm. But but I, I but that's how I think about it, and I, I think it's possible that that they could they could. It, if the Fed blinks, right? If they say no, you know, we're not, we're not going to go down the, you know, the Weimar route, the, the '70s route. We're not going to put the money. We're just let the banks blow up. Then I think silver might have problems. Gold would go crazy. Yeah, uh, silver yeah. might not. I think the chances of happening again are, are almost zero. But yeah, it, yeah. It I is. mean, if you just look at how weak Powell has been in the last month, it's yeah. The, the answer is zero. I mean, these people are almost know. zero. <laughs> <laughs> almost zero. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's almost zero. You never know, obviously. So. Yeah. But also, but it's important. To know that, you know, the the point of gold. People say, "Well, if I have gold, I can't use it in the crisis because I'll get shot." And people steal. And the answer is, well, that's partially true. I mean, the point of gold is is to preserve your capital through the dark. I was at a coin store here in New York uh, several years ago called Stacks, which is an institution, mm-hmm. and there were some guys. I think they were Iranian. And they had stacks of, of gold coins. Mm-hmm. I think they just got off the boat and they were selling their gold. To, I don't know, over a laundry mat. I, mean, I don't know what it was. But they got their, their capital out mm-hmm. uh, and, and they're restoring life. And, and that, I mean, again, I don't expect, you know, it doesn't mean Americans are going to boat and go somewhere else. But it's just in terms of the credit cycle, it, gold keeps your capital through the cycle. And then you got something when the system reestablishes itself. Yeah, right. I think, uh, I think all our investors out there who've been in this game for a long enough time understand that it's maybe the short term guys who don't get that, uh, right. the bigger, the bigger game of foot. But I really, really do appreciate you coming on today, Daniel, and, um, uh, wanted to give, uh, you a plug. I mean, how, how can, how can people who, who like what you had to say, how can they follow you? How can they get your research? Yeah. So I do a, a, a letter, a monthly letter, bi monthly now letter on my website. It's, uh, uh www.mermicon.com M-Y-R on my website it's uh, uh, www.mermicon.com M-Y-R-M-I-K-A-N and uh, it's free to sign up and uh, you know again when, when I have time I, I put something out um, but uh, it's yeah, it's been it's been a fun intellectual journey and I think I think we're really after nine long years I've been at this business um, which is very long for most people but I, I, I got into right after the last better collapse mm-hmm. when, I, when I you know I did my own study I realized what the hell was going on, the context I had been missing. Mm-hmm. And I think we are uh, towards the end of this credit cycle and, and, and rapidly you know, the funnel will start happening for gold investors, I think, very, very soon. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on this week, and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to you soon. Great. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm.